Thank you very much, Debbie, and good afternoon, everybody. It's very good to be here. I'm going to look at perspective and really share some observations from um, the funding that we've been doing over the last three and a half odd months. Um, I wanted to talk about sort of four areas, really, adaptability, technology, place, uh, and the kind of ecosystem, and then just round up with some thoughts about where now. Um, First point, adaptability. Um, I think if we look at the response from the community to COVID-19, we cannot but be impressed with the speed and the accuracy with which communities have uh, organised themselves. Um, largely in the absence of planning um, and out with the technocratic process that we all live in. Um, so let's have a little think about that. Uh, what's also interesting, I think, in community responses, often responses end up being multi-purpose. So you might think they're about food, but actually they're about loneliness. Um, I'm very conscious of some teachers locally who uh, have been had been delivering food parcels to vulnerable youngsters who should have been in school but weren't. Uh, and what they were doing there was, yes, they were making sure they got meals, but they were also making sure that they were okay and their family circumstances were okay. You see restaurateurs who completely reconfigured their business model to work with a community group to get food out. Veterans um, food organisations that generally bring people together to eat, actually just delivering food. Berry Women's, Asian Women's Centre, very obvious one, producing fusion food um, and completely changing the way in which they operate. Similarly, uh, around kit, um, the sort of absence of digital equipment for large swathes of people who really need it has been addressed by communities just getting neighbours to collect their uh, redundant bits of kit or what they thought were redundant, uh, experts reconfiguring them and getting them out. Um, similarly, complete redesign of services around loneliness with things like peer mentoring, um, huge numbers of volunteers offering to operate online and locally and local charities having to reconfigure the way in which they the which way they operate those services um jambo radio in glasgow uh, a, a, a multilingual african um radio service that's gone from streaming music to streaming advice and help for for those particular community groups and i think what i would observe um around all of this is that we've talked a little bit or Daisy certainly talked about the disproportionate impact on certain communities I think there's an also, also an interesting question about actually whether there's been a disproportionately positive response from certain communities um, and whether we've really tracked that and I would notably talk about a number of those are under the radio radar not the radio um, they might be unincorporated groups they might be your street they might be a faith group um, but they probably don't fit into any category um, I think funders have also been adaptable. Um, we managed to get 120 million quids worth of cash out in the first six weeks of the emergency and we completely reconfigured our entire funding programmes for the first six months of this financial year and we weren't alone in working that fast. So it's interesting how much you can do when you really put your mind to it and how quickly you do it. Technology. Well, is technology an enabler or has it been a disabler? It's obviously been a bit of both. I've talked about how many services have moved online and this isn't just major national charities and community networks going online. It's small little organisations. A great example, Sunbeams Cumbria provides music therapy for kids. Now it's providing specialist music streaming to disabled people across Cumbria. Hope in Community in Bury doing a very similar thing with its peer support services. I think what we see is that technology has transformed the way in which some services are being delivered and transformed future opportunity, but it won't all be about staying exactly as it is. Um, flip side of the kind of digital bit is data. I think generally the data response has been pretty poor. Uh, I, I think communities, charities, the social infrastructure sector is behind on really having great data. Um, Final interesting issue on data. Um, there's a sort of assumption that if you've got no technology in your organisation, you're no good in some way. Either you're a bit dodgy or suspicious, or you're just a bit incompetent. Uh, I think we should challenge that assumption. Lots of little organisations, they don't need technology to do what they do. Um, so technology can enable, but it isn't an answer. And I think as we make some quite big choices moving forward, we have to think about what are the values that drive those choices rather than the technology that drives them. So in other words, we utilize the technology for, for social purpose. 
place. One observation, the unit of identification is very, very local. Um, my parents live in a village of 200. Um, for me, in lockdown, my unit of identification has been my street and my park. I think most people would say something pretty similar. Um, definitely a rebirth of neighbourliness. I mean, I'm sure all of you have been involved in mutual aid groups and, and your street coming out and all the rest of it. Um, and it's not just been about, um, about sort of food parcels and, and, and so on. It's also about improving your neighbourhood. It's about neighbourhood watches coming together and putting up hanging baskets and so on. Second point around place. Um, many of us have been working from home. This will re redefine uh, our cities and our places of work. Uh, it will redefine how we think about public space. It'll redefine uh, how we think about our home, uh, what we want our city centres to be, uh, and how we use them to bring people together in ways that we probably won't have done before because they won't all be coming to the office anymore, etc. Um, ecosystem. My real question here is, where does value get added and by whom and how? And is that overarching ecosystem right from national down to those street based groups? Is it more than the sum of the parts? And I would observe there's a lot of tensions. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting sort of juxtaposition between local action that's just got on with it and a sort of national desire um, to coordinate or to oversee or to gather data or even possibly to control. Um, there was a wonderful moment in the response where there was a sort of conversation about volunteers and how wouldn't it be marvellous if we had a national database of all the volunteers so that if there was a shortage of volunteers in East Hartlepool, we could tell West Hartlepool and then they could find some. But of course, what actually happens on the ground is the people who live in East Hartlepool talk to the people in West Hartlepool uh, and they don't need to go through that convoluted process. Um, Charities have faced, I think, the same tension between local branches, local activity and big national programmes. We, we see it, we get a lot of applications in from local branches of national charities, often very customised what they're looking for. Uh, and there's a tension between what the expertise at the centre is finding and analysing, saying is a priority, and what those local branches uh, are saying. Similarly with standards, I was really interested in one of the immediate responses I heard from the sort of what you might call the highly professionalised end of the sector around all these glorious volunteers who wanted to go and talk to the old lady next door or down the street. Um, well, they haven't been trained in safeguarding. We can't let them do, we can't let all these people go off and do that. Um, of course, those are really genuine points, but actually, what about the entrepreneurial spirit and the spirit of generosity that just wants to get on with it? And I think there's a real tension between the desire to be tidy uh, and the human desire to do things that are messy and how do you calibrate between the two so just to sort of come through to sort of final thoughts um, there are opportunities I think to do things differently I would really observe that there has been a lot of what we would call generous leadership in this emergency people working collaboratively whether that's horizontally across charitable sectors, whether that's vertically between the national and the local. I think infrastructure bodies have really risen to the challenge of thinking about what they're there for, how do they add value, how do they help that little community organisation. I think funders have got better actually at sharing data and thinking about how they can be complementary. I do wonder if we need to think a little bit about um, given the funding constraints that we already see, the reduction in income that charities have faced and the increase in demand, how is that ecosystem going to work effectively in the future? And how can you do more on less? Uh, and I think that um, really plays to some of the stuff that has been happening locally, where actually they, they haven't needed a lot of money to get an awful lot done. Final couple of thoughts. Um, I, I would observe that I think the mainstream struggles to cope with systems that don't look like it. So um, communities that operate, for example, on a cash basis, um, communities that don't operate digitally, communities that are not interested in scale replication, um, communities that are not incorporated or even organisations, um, communities that are not driven by money. Uh, our, our structures and our systems um, really can't quite cope with people who work to or, or organizations or other systems and processes that work to a different agenda. 
which kind of brings me to my last question, which I think is really interesting. Um, somewhere in my briefing, someone said, how can communities be harnessed to better effect? And I was thinking, well, that's really interesting because that assumes that communities are here as an instrument of something else. Uh, whereas I think we ought to think about whether communities actually have an intrinsic value of their own right in actually being a part of the human condition. Part of what creates well-being in people is belonging to a community and people make lots of choices about what sort of communities and to what extent. Uh, and, uh, and it comes back to my point about systems really. I think we tend to think about communities and people as being cogs in systems that are designed by centres. I think we should be moving to be thinking about how do those systems become cogs in people's lives that then support and enable people to live good life, good and better lives. Uh, and that is about systems being people-led, strengths-based and fundamentally about human relationships.